Hi, everyone. Welcome to the SEJ Think Tank. Um, today, we are going to be talking about content marketing excellence in 2016, driving profitable content marketing techniques. And today, we're joined by Prashant Puri. He is the CEO and co-founder of AdLift, who's sponsoring the webinar today. My name is Kelsey Jones. I am the executive editor of Search Engine Journal. Um, right now, I'm going to let Prashant just kind of quickly introduce himself, and then I will go into some housekeeping before we get started with the presentation. So, Prashant, do you want to kind of introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, excited to be here uh, on, on SEJ Think Tank. So, thanks for having me here. Yeah, welcome. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about content marketing and driving uh, profitable content marketing uh, techniques in 2016. Uh, just as a quick introduction about uh, myself and AdLift, uh, I'm the CEO co-founder of AdLift. I've been doing SEO well uh, over, over 10 years now. Um, worked with a couple of Fortune 500 companies like Yahoo, eBay, AT&T before starting AdLift. Uh, um, after the webinar's over, feel free to reach out to me or, or direct message or through email. So you've got my handles right here. And uh, to introduce AdLift, uh, we've been in business for a little over five years now, work pretty much across the board with a number of Fortune 500, SMB, as well as startups. Uh, we're not too far away from San Francisco in uh, sunny uh, California. Awesome. I would love some California weather right now. It's really rainy here in Kansas City. <laughs> So a little bit of housekeeping before Prashant gets started with his presentation. If during the webinar you have any questions, comments, um, anything you want to say, feel free to let us know through the question or chat box on the GoToWebinar. You can also live tweet or ask questions on Twitter. Our lovely social producer, Caitlin, will be handling that. And then Danielle is moderating the webinar comments. On Twitter, you can use the hashtag SEJThinkTank, all one word. And we're going to also be doing a lot, um, or not a lot, two poll questions throughout the presentation to kind of get you guys more engaged and kind of get a feel of what our audience is like. And so feel free to participate in those and look through for those throughout the presentation. We're also going to do a Q&A at the end. So feel free to ask questions throughout the entire webinar so you don't forget them at the end. And then Danielle will pass those on to me that, to then give to Prashant so he can answer your questions. Throughout the webinar as well, we're going to be giving links to resources or notes. Danielle will be doing that again in the chat box. And then lastly, the entire webinar is going to be recorded and it will be made live on YouTube after the webinar, usually in the next few days, along with the recap. Prashant's slides will also be available on SlideShare, so check out SCJ um, tomorrow or Thursday for those. And if you, again, if you have any questions, let us know. Without any further delay, let's talk about content marketing. Awesome. So with that, uh, Kelsey, over to you on the first poll question. So I thought we'd start with uh, kind of the, the important poll question. So uh, Kelsey, yes. do you want to guide everyone through this? Sure. I'm going to launch the poll now so you guys can answer. So the, questions, the question is, do you currently have a documented content marketing strategy in place? So the possible answers are yes, no, but no, we are planning to. So we usually like to wait until about 60% or more have answered. Right now we're about at 50%, which is awesome. You guys could keep voting. I'll keep it open for a couple more seconds. Uh, we have about two-thirds, so that's awesome. Wait a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. So as you can see, um, over about half are saying no, but we are planning to, which is awesome that you're in the webinar today because I know Rashawn has a lot of really great strategies and techniques for getting a, a documented um, process in place. And then the other choices were evenly split. So good to know. Um, and Prashant, let's get started. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, I guess all of you are in the right place. So hopefully this webinar would be uh, very fruitful in uh, devising a content marketing uh, strategy and plan in place for 2016. So with that, um, let's move on to why content marketing is so important. So I've pulled a couple of uh, 
graphs uh, from Content Marketing Institute that did a recent survey uh, where they <clears throat> essentially pulled together a lot of interesting data. I kind of pulled about three graphs from that data. One was, uh, you know, how, how many of you actually use content marketing within your organization? And, uh, you know, the great news is today uh, over three-fourths or 76 percent said yes, that they are using content marketing. Uh, and the results for both B2B and B2C were very similar, so I kind of pulled in B2C uh, respondents here. Uh, and then how would you actually measure effectiveness of your content marketing uh, initiative? So from a profitability or a return on investment perspective, uh, what are the different metrics that you look at? Obviously, the top two were sales and conversions, but it was interesting to see SEO rankings as being one of the most uh, uh, top five uh, most uh, effective measures uh, to to measure effectiveness of SEO. So this kind of ties into what we're about to talk about, which is uh, how content marketing and SEO go hand in hand in driving uh, a lot of sales conversions uh, to your website. But with that, uh, also one of the biggest challenges for content marketers today is producing engaging content. So I'm going to start off with uh, uh, looking at how to, what are the different techniques and uh, nuggets of information that you should be aware of while creating share-worthy content. So throughout the webinar, what I'm going to do is talk to each of these pieces, which is creating share-worthy content, identifying influencers and link-worthy websites to submit content to and market your content, and then mitigating risk, and at the end, uh, talk about profitability and how to actually uh, calculate ROI. So the first segment is creating share-worthy content. I've pulled some interesting information from a study that was done by Moss and Basumo, where they polled uh, or selected randomly about 100,000 posts, which they analyzed. Uh, at the end of the analysis, what they what they found was uh, over 50 percent had less than two or less uh, less than two uh, Facebook interactions, shares, likes, and comments. And uh, over three-fourths, or 75%, had zero external links. So overall, the, the study uh, essentially called out that uh, the amount of content that's created out there for a large majority is, is poor. And for, for, for the most part, marketers uh, are not doing a very good job in actually amplifying their content. So. Uh, this is definitely something that uh, you know we want to speak to. So think about when you are creating a lot of content. Uh, what are the different parameters that you want to benchmark yourself against while creating these? Uh, furthermore, uh, within the uh, analysis, what they looked at was uh, key performance indicators. So if you're creating a post, how many times is it shared and linked to? What they found was that there's very little overlap or very few posts that have both shares as well as links. And the ones that did hit the sweet spot uh, created a lot of content with a lot of deep research uh, and a lot of opinion forming content. So this was where a lot of thought was gone into creating that level of content which drove both shares as well as uh, links. So. When you're thinking about creating content, uh, you want to make sure that there's a lot of research that's gone into it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, polls or opinion forming content, which would be very interesting to read. And that's what's going to really drive uh, getting both links as well as, uh, as shares. And then lastly, uh, they correlated the length uh, of the posts with the total average shares. Uh, and the number of links or domain links referring uh, to those specific uh, posts. And no surprise here where the longer the post is, the more information that there is in, in a particular post, it drives a lot more uh, average shares and has a lot more domains linking to it. Uh, what is interesting was out of the 100,000 uh, posts out there, a large majority that was sampled uh, had words which were less than 1,000, which essentially didn't drive a lot of shares uh, or, or links back to it. So a couple of key things to look out for when creating share-worthy content is 
really uh, spending a lot of time and doing a lot of research around the topic that you want to talk about and then creating content which would be share worthy. This segues pretty well into what are the different elements that you should be looking into when identifying uh, links to submit content to or drive, uh, drive links from. So I essentially want to start off with keyword targeting. So uh, the number one question you want to answer is what are my customers looking for and how do I begin? Uh, the Google Keyword Planner tool is great in really diving deep into uh, keyword segments, uh, both the, the head, torso, as well as the tail, looking at the competition. Uh, sometimes the, the bid value also gives you an idea of how competitive uh, the keywords are. Uh, gets you a lot more information in terms of the different keyword sets that folks are actually searching for. Another great tool uh, that I like to use is Uber Suggest. So what Uber Suggest does is it essentially puts in all the keywords which are within the Google Suggest uh, box uh, into one place for you to easily export. So if you're looking for exactly what Google uses from a suggestion perspective, uh, you can get all of that data. Uh, via Uber Suggest. And then last but not the least, in terms of keyword targeting and looking at different keyword sets that you really want to build your content around, GrepWords is, is an excellent tool which further refines uh, your query building uh, capabilities. So if you're a big fan of regular expressions, you could add those in here. You could exclude and include data uh, based on beginning with, ends with, containing to further refine your overall keyword targeting segments. So once you've got uh, uh, your, your set of targeted keywords and that you want to go after, you want to maybe spend some time in looking at how your competitors are, are driving uh, content links back to their website. So Ahrefs is a great tool to dive into that. So here you could essentially enter the, the name of the competitor. So I've used WebEx here as an example. And what Ahrefs does is it spits out all the different links that are linking back to WebEx, both the home page as well as all of the different deep pages. You could export all of this data and then you could slice and dice it any which way you want. One of the things that we uh, love about Ahrefs is it actually gives you a lot of social engagement metrics. So it calls out what are the websites that drive a lot of social engagement and those should be part of your target list of sites you want to go after to acquire uh, content marketing pieces and links back to your deep uh, landing pages. Another great tool is Content Runner. Uh, what Content Runner does is uh, you, know, you can essentially again enter a keyword here. So I've used video conferencing as an example. It cleans up that search query and it spits out all the different uh, keywords that would be great or, or queries or phrases that would be good for creating content topics. So this is a great way for, for you to figure out what are the different topics I want to write about. You could essentially enter a keyword and it will give you a list of different topics that you could build your content around. What it also does is it pings Twitter to pull in all the relevant tweets that have that specific keyword mentioned uh, within the tweet. So again, this kind of starts to help build your influencer base, folks that are very interested in that particular topic or keyword, and you can start to reach out to them in terms of having them uh, tweet, create, write content on, on your behalf. So it kind of starts to look towards building out your influencer outreach uh, program. Lastly, uh, looking at Google Alerts, so this is again a super simple uh, tool uh, that, that I love. Uh, you can you know, enter pretty much any search query here, uh, decide on how often uh, you want uh, an alert set. Uh, what this does is it kind of, every time there's a, that specific keyword mentioned in the news, it'll send you an alert. This again helps you build out your database for both influencers, authors, uh, or publishers that are creating content on topics that you really want to be published for. Lastly, touching a little bit more about influencer outreach is a tool that we leverage. It's called Topsy. Uh, what Topsy does is it gives you uh, a ton of filters 
to really refine your overall search. So you can enter the keyword that you want to uh, drill down on, and then you can also look into the, the most recent or the most latest results, uh, tweets that have been tweeted for the specific keyword. You could uh, essentially zone in on uh, tweets that only have links in them. So if that's what you're interested in, you could filter that out. And another great uh, filter is influencers. So uh, they've got their uh, sentiment score that ranks influencers. And it would essentially look out, it would very easily pull out all the different influencers that have tweeted in that specific keyword or link pertaining to that specific topic. So again, helps you really build out your overall uh, content marketing strategy with an influencer outreach uh, program in, in place. So with uh, identifying link worthy websites, uh, uh, the, the next portion is, is mitigating risk. So this is where uh, I want to spend a little bit of time as you think about content marketing and reaching out to websites. Uh, the panda and penguin that we once knew uh, over the last couple of years has definitely evolved and changed. So what this means is that we need to have a much closer look into our own link profile. So what are the different links that, are, that we're currently acquiring, content marketing that we're currently acquiring, and what does that look like and benchmark ourselves moving forward. The way I like to do this is really uh, understanding your overall link distribution. So we use two different tools to help us do this. One is Moz. So what we've done here is we've essentially taken all the different links, pointing back to a website, and we've uh, graph them or plotted them against domain authority. Uh, if, if you see a large number of links that have uh, uh, a smaller uh, domain authority in the 1 to 10, 11 to 20 range, you definitely want to start analyzing your competitors to see how does the competitive landscape look like. Uh, 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 is your website an outlier? And then based on what those results are, you could take corrective uh, measures. So you could dive deeper into what those low quality links are, whether you need to disavow them, reach out to folks to, to clean them up. So really knowing where you currently stand is a, is a good way to start your overall content marketing initiatives for, for 2016. Another tool to help you do this is looking at Ahrefs. So this, is a, this gives you a much broader sample size uh, if you're on a much larger uh, website. And one of the things that we do here is uh, we strip out, uh, we, we only graph out unique linking domains. So if, there are, if there's a website that's linking to you 100 times, we'll count that as one link, and we'll only look at unique linking domains, and then we'll graph that out across Ahrefs domain rank. This kind of gives you a little bit of a cleaner picture on what the overall uh, uh, plot looks like. And again, based on analysis, you want to you wanna take uh, an action on whether you want to uh, course correct or uh, is, this, is this the right uh, linking domain uh, graph that you want to move forward with. I want to kind of call out a, a case study here. So we, we did uh, a similar exercise for a client that we engaged with. What we found was there's a lot of low quality links that they built up back in the day. Uh, which essentially resulted in a significant drop of their SEO visibility and traffic. Uh, on finding a lot of these low quality links, we went ahead and disavowed their, did a lot of cleanup, uh, and then concentrated on a much more robust cleaner content marketing strategy, which essentially over time helped them build up their uh, SEO visibility and traffic. One of the things that we looked into was what was their brand versus non-brand anchor tech segmentation? So if it is heavily skewed towards non-brand keywords, again, something you want to look into. And if you've got a ton of low quality uh, backlinks uh, uh, pointing to specific anchor text, uh, that's again something that would uh, not be preferable. So essentially creating an overall anchor text segmentation of all your non-brand links and looking at how the links are inbound is something you want to keep a, a pretty close lookout for. And then lastly, taking this one step further, 
is analyzing all your current landing pages, including your homepage, uh, excluding the homepage, looking at your top seven page drivers, and how the link distribution looks like. So again, if a large majority of the backlinks of, a, of an e-commerce website is, is concentrated only on seven pages, that again could not, uh, wouldn't be a good signal. So having a more distributed uh, landing page to anchor tech segmentation, something that looks more like this idly in, in kind of a best case scenario is preferable because it then helps drive uh, domain strength, page strength, uh, right down to the, the page level. As you are uh, putting together a list of sites that you want to reach out to from a content marketing perspective. A couple of things to look out for is how is their traffic trending? How are their keywords uh, performing? Uh, for this, we look into SEM Rush. So SEM Rush gives you traffic over time uh, for, for different websites. Uh, it's, it's definitely a great tool uh, that we, that we uh, recognize and, and uh, would, would recommend using. If there are sites that you want to reach out to where the traffic curve looks something like this, you probably don't want to reach out to them because they themselves are not driving a lot of traffic, which would be pointless for you to submit your, your content pieces to, or they might be hit with, uh, with, with a penalty. Apart from SCM Rush, uh, we look at search metrics data. Uh, again, it kind of gives you uh, SEO visibility uh, uh, trend lines over time. Uh, if it's declining over a long period of time, you probably want to stay away from that website. Also, from a position spread perspective, if a lot of the keywords are not in the top 10 or top 20, again, it, it's probably a website that's not being ranked enough. Uh, again, something to think about whether you really want to reach out to, to that particular website. Uh, just a quick note about negative SEO or again, keeping a pretty close look out for your, your own uh, content marketing as well as your uh, links uh, that are linking back to your website is having a process in place where you download the latest links and you kind of do a quick review of these links to see which ones are of high authority and which ones aren't. Uh, the ones that aren't, uh, we recommend disavowing them proactively. Uh, we've done this for a number of uh, our clients where we put this process in place where if there are links that look to be coming from very low authority sites, uh, you just want to be proactive in disavowing them versus being hit by, by a penalty. Uh, with that, uh, we'll move on to our second uh, poll question uh, that Kelsey will walk you through. Awesome. Thanks, Prashant. So I'm going to look at my other screen right now where I, where, so I can launch the poll. Okay, so if everyone could answer, that'd be great. So the question is, are you going to spend more or will the spend remain the same for your content marketing in 2016? So the possible answers are that you will spend more next year or you're going to have your spend remain the same next year. So we'll just keep it open for a couple more minutes. And again, while you guys are voting, reminder, uh, you can live tweet with the hashtag SCJ Think Tank. Be sure to ask questions for Prashant throughout the whole webinar so um, we can ask him during the Q&A at the end. Okay, so I'm going to close this. It looks like most of you, 69%, are going to be spending more in 2016. So that's promising. Um, that's what I expected, especially since you're attending a webinar on content marketing. So good results. And now we can go back to the presentation. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, so with that, before we move on to the, uh, the ROI and, and calculating profitable return on investment, uh, I want to kind of flip back to one of the one of the uh, nuggets of information that we looked at earlier, which was what are the different uh, top challenges for content marketers, and the number one was producing engaging content. I want to introduce you to uh, our internal platform called Content Lift, uh, which we built out in the last three years. Uh, what Content Lift does is it has over 10,000 publishers, 4,500 authors, so it's kind of a marketplace of 
very high authority publishers as well as authors uh, that create content for specific uh, uh, verticals uh, and, and publishes it on specific websites across different verticals. Uh, while we uh, kind of do the due diligence of, of adding publishers to the platform, Internally, we've kind of built out uh, APIs which ping a lot of the different metrics we just discussed. So looking at domain authority, SEO visibility, position spread over a period of time, this kind of enables us to weed out sites that we probably don't want part of the content lift platform or don't want our clients and partners to drive uh, their content marketing efforts via. So this is a pretty nifty tool that we use for pretty much all our uh, uh, partners and clients that we work on for their content marketing initiatives, which really helps drive up uh, a lot of quality content at scale uh, and then track effectiveness over time. As part of the overall content publishing process, we divvy this up into uh, four parts, which is planning the overall uh, content schedule. So coming up with the keywords, the research around it, uh, conceptualizing the ideas of the topics that we want to create content for, uh, and then going ahead and doing the, the thematic outreach, so which are the different authors and publishers we want to reach out to, uh, and create the content, publish it, and then measure across a number of different KPIs like user engagement, uh, organic visibility, rankings, social shares, and, and brand mentions. So with that, I uh, want to move to the, 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 the last piece of the webinar, which is calculating ROI. So with all this great effort that we put into, we want to make sure over time there's a positive return on investment. So how do we go about doing that? Return on investment is essentially calculating your overall revenue, uh, taking away cost, and then div dividing that by overall cost. So the first thing we want to do is benchmark ourselves on current traffic uh, or goals or revenue. Uh, once we benchmark our current goals and traffic, we know where we currently stand and when we flip the switch on our content marketing efforts, we can track how traffic is trending over a period of time and how goals are being completed over a period of time. So benchmarking where you currently stand becomes extremely important because that's how you know what kind of incremental traffic or revenue or goals or transactions, all your key performance indicators are tracking over a period of time. You want to also go ahead and uh, put in a, a process in place that calculates your monthly costs. So this could be agency fees, freelance costs, creative costs, in-house costs. So everything that helps you create the content, syndicate it, um, build it out, this could also be in-house development costs. You want to track that to figure out what your overall cost for creating that content is. Once you've got your cost created and you've benchmarked where you currently are, there are two ways of calculating revenue. So one is the direct revenue generated. So this could be how, uh, if you're an e-commerce website, uh, this is where your transactions happen because of the different content pieces that you've created over time and then the revenue generated. So this is uh, pretty, sim pretty simple to just pull this data out of Google Analytics and then track how this is moving over a period of time and what's the incremental revenue that the content is generating. The, the second way is the indirect revenue that's generated, which is a little more difficult to calculate, which I'll go over, which essentially involves a goal. So you might have, so you, you might be in a B2B space uh, or a B2, B2C space where there's a, there's a goal completion uh, that's done. Uh, the way you want to calculate uh, revenue here is you want to add a goal value. Uh, the way goal value would be calculated is you would be uh, looking at what your total revenue generated by your website is and then the number of goals uh, that helped you get there. So dividing total revenue by the number of goals would give you the value of each goal. You can use that value, that average value for your content marketing initiatives. So anytime there are in incremental goals that are completed due to the content marketing pieces that are driving traffic, that's your incremental goal and the value. The way indirect revenue would then be calculated is you would be looking at incremental goals completed 
uh, into the overall goal value, the average goal value, which would, in this example, uh, from the time that you started to about six to 12 months down the line, would work out to roughly uh, a little over a quarter million dollars. Uh, so the, these are the two ways of generating and calculating revenue. Uh, now that you have the revenue numbers, uh, Calculating your return on investment becomes pretty simple. So that's essentially your overall revenue generated minus the agency cost divided up by the agency cost. It's really important to have this in place as you begin your content marketing initiatives. Uh, you know, this is not something that would be positive ROI from week one or, or week three, but just tracking that and making sure you're moving into the right uh, direction and you're moving into uh, the black versus versus the red uh, is uh, is the way you'd want to track your ROI for your content marketing initiatives. Another way that we add uh, essentially provide value from a from a, an SEO perspective is looking at the different networks that help drive content. So Taboola and Outbrain are definitely ones that come to mind. Uh, these are great ways. Uh, to drive uh, a lot of great uh, and low cost per click uh, traffic to your website, but also gives you a, a sort of an inkling of what that uh, traffic is worth. So if you were to drive 100K visits via any of these channels, on an average, this would probably cost you anywhere between fifty to $60,000. Uh, this is a good way to put forward a business case for a lot of you that are looking to start content marketing and spend more in 2016 to build a business case around, hey, if I was actually driving this incremental amount of visits through SEO, these are these are what the cost savings might look like versus going through a network. So definitely try out these networks. Uh, a lot of these work really well, but this is a great way to provide and calculate the value of SEO-driven content uh, marketing. So with that, uh, I want to sum it up by just going over a couple of uh, important elements in terms of creating uh, share-worthy content. So focus on a lot of the, uh, the deep research, uh, larger number of words for long-form content. Uh, when you're looking at identifying uh, different uh, sites, uh, start with keyword research and segmentation using a number of different tools like Google Planner, GrepWords, Uber Suggest. Uh, look at influencer outreach through AHFs, Topsy, uh, Content Runner, and then have a pretty exhaustive understanding of what your internal uh, link metrics looks like. So use SCMrush search metrics to really mitigate the risk of going after sites that might not be worthy of driving a lot of content pieces from, uh, and then. Uh, take a more proactive approach in your overall content marketing initiatives by monitoring and putting a process to monitor your incoming links on a weekly, monthly uh, basis. So that's what I had, folks, uh, for this webinar. Uh, I will hand this over to Kelsey. I hope you enjoyed it and it was worth your time. Yeah, thanks for all the information, Prashant. A lot of really good tools, and I liked how you showed examples of how you were using those tools, so that was cool. So before we get to the Q&A, I want to make sure to promote our next webinar, which is on December 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be with Larry Kim of WordStream, and our founder, Lauren Baker, will be moderating. It's covering um, Facebook and Twitter advertising. And so Larry has a lot of good insight on that. So be sure not to miss that. Um, Danielle will put a link to register in the chat box, I believe, if you want to register now. So that being said, let's get to the Q&A. And it's not too late to ask questions. So you can still ask questions in the GoToWebinar control panel. And if I'm looking off to the side, it's to look at my other monitors. So I'm not ignoring you guys. I'm going to look at the questions that Danielle is sending to me. So, Prashant, are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, let's see. Okay. So, here's kind of a long question from James Maurice. How would content marketing specifically for SEO or organic ranking purposes be critical for a company who wants to franchise a business? 
So they have systematically been um, optimizing SEO for the new um, areas that they've been launching businesses in. So how could content marketing work with that? That's a that's a, that's a really good question. So uh, just to understand the question, how would content marketing work for a franchise business? I think the way I would look at it is uh, is kind of a two pronged approach. So one is uh, building out the brand for the franchise. So working towards content marketing for the brand itself, and it's going to help with all the different franchises that follow from that point on. So concentrating on a lot of brand amplification through content marketing. And then secondly, if it's a, if there's a local play associated with it, uh, you'd want to do a lot of local content marketing for the specific franchise uh, 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 locations that you that you launch. So this was this would involve uh, content marketing at a more granular and and a local level. So I would start with an overall brand content marketing and then spin that off into a geo-specific content marketing initiative. Do you think that each location should be doing their own blog posts um, or is it more important that the top level company website have the best content? I think it would, uh, it, it, it would go hand in hand. So you need the, the brand itself. And again, you know, once you're building out the brand, it's going to help with your franchise model. So that's definitely something you want to do. And then each of the the, the different uh, franchises should be building out their own content so that you start to drive a lot of uh, specific uh, traffic to that specific uh, franchise uh, locations or, or websites. Okay, cool. Yeah, that seems doable for sure. Um, James, hopefully that answered your question. Moving forward, Jean has a really good question. So hers is on content length. If you're publishing on your own website, is it better to post five 500 word posts a month or just one um, 2,500 word per post per month in terms of SEO? So is quantity better over length? That's a great question. So, uh, you know, and this is definitely something that we, we looked at uh, earlier in the slides which was a study done by Moz uh, and Basumo. So, uh, and I would kind of go with that where I would concentrate on the quality of content. So even if you're doing one 500 word post or one uh, 1000 word post versus even a 2500, uh, you want to go with quality versus content uh, versus frequency. So, uh, the overall idea is, you know, you want to, if you are resource constrained and you, and you know, you're essentially churning out content just, just because you want to hit that number of five, uh, I wouldn't do that. I would spend a lot of time in creating that one post, whether it's 500, 1000, whatever your resource would entail you to do, but it should be newsworthy and, and share worthy and, and link worthy. So that's essentially what I would put top of mind in coming up with a strategy of creating content on a weekly and a monthly basis. Okay, yeah, so you're kind of saying that focus on the quality, not so much we have to get a blog post out every week or we have to write one this month. You know, it's more about making sure that the content is actually worth reading. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so here's an interesting question. Um, I'm not going to say your name right. Milos, he was asking um, about disavowing links, which kind of gets more into SEO versus content marketing. Um, he, It looks like he has a lot of referral spam because he gave us the website. I'm not going to say what it is, but it has over 170,000 incoming links to his site. Should you disavow um, referral spam or how do you handle that? We need to, it's difficult to provide feedback uh, just uh, without having, you know, the website or the context. So if Milos would like to reach out directly, uh, you can reach out, uh, I can be reached at Prashant at the rate adlib.com. We can have a look at it and then provide a more uh, qualified response. But uh, off the top of my head, difficult to answer what, what it should be. What, because we need to kind of look at what those referral links look like. Yeah. Yeah, and I, it's, that seems like more of a SEO 
problem than content. So Milos, feel free to email Prashan. Hopefully he can help you. Uh, Jean has another interesting question. So she says, I thought Google's Mac Cuts said that guest posting was dead. Is there a difference between guest posting and publishing content on other sites? How effective is posting? And then her second question is, how effective is posting almost exclusively on your own site? Mm, that's a, again a great question. So, so every time Google uh, you know comes out with with I, I would say changes or, or thoughts around specific content marketing strategies, it's basically because it's been uh, done to that and it's not been done effectively. So when you talk about guest posts, uh, everyone creates a lot of great guest posts. So I myself, uh, you know write for search engine journal once in a while. I guess post for search engine journal. Uh, it gets a lot of tweets, retweets, shares. I think it's great content. At least that's the, that's, that's the yeah, feedback that that's I, good. I, I get. And that's a guest post. And is that is that spammy? Is that something you shouldn't do? Absolutely not. So again, it goes back to creating quality versus maybe creating you know 30 guest posts, one for every day, uh, 30 times a month uh, versus actually creating one quality uh, guest post and having folks who read it, uh, wow about it, talk about it, link to it is definitely the way that I would uh, I would approach uh, content marketing. And yes, uh, I think content marketing and SEO and rankings they go. They, it's a two pronged approach. So you want external websites to link back to you. But at the same time, you want to create really good shareworthy content on your website so that you drive that traffic to and you're beefing up your content on your website. So from a content marketing perspective, it's not one or the other. It's having great content on other third party sites that link back to you or mention you and then having great content on your website too and having a plan in place to, to, to uh, put that in motion. Yeah, and I also think too um, when the kind of guest blogging that Matt Cutts said was frowned upon is if you're guest blogging just to sneak in a link to your own your own content. And so um, if you're going to be guest blogging on other people's sites, it's a, it should be to provide information and set yourself up as a thought leader versus, oh, how can I sneak in a link back to my site? I think just kind of framing it the right way helps too. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, Banu, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name wrong, um, they want to know how can content marketing work for B2B in a specific niche, like um, the example he gives is warranties. Sorry, what was the example? I didn't get that. Uh, like warranties, um, I don't. he doesn't specify, so maybe like home warranties or... Um, product warranty. So, how could that work for for B two B content? Yeah. So, I think this again is a great question, and we we get this question a lot. And in saying that, hey, you know, for B two C we get that, but for B two B does it really work? The the overall the overall uh, goal uh, of content marketing is is I would say pretty agnostic to the vertical. So, whether it's B two C or B two B, the overall idea is that you want to be a thought leader, you want to drive content to your target audience. And whether you're on the B2B side or on the B2C side or within B2B, you're a, you know, you're a very niche specific vertical, content marketing absolutely would work because you, you need to target that audience uh, that's interested in that specific product. At Adlif, we work with a number of B2B folks uh, across very niche uh, Products, you know, this could be an enterprise-level product which targets, uh, you know, CTOs. Uh, it could be a product that's targeting only CMOs, a handful of them. But again, content marketing really helps in targeting those folks in really creating that level of content and putting it out there where your target audience would essentially read uh, and and think of you as a thought leader when it actually goes through that uh, amount of information. So. Uh, you know, quick quick answer is absolutely for both B two B and B two C content marketing is is definitely very important. Yeah, good answer. And I think too, um, it's important to keep in mind that you're targeting people, not not specifically companies. So the people that are going to read your content 
are, you know, just part of the company. So thinking of it from that perspective versus how do I target an entire organization has helped me as well whenever I've had clients. Um, okay, so we're about almost at the end of our time. Um, just a couple more questions. Um, well, one isn't really a question, but Cheryl Kaplow said to tell you hi, Prashant. She said that you guys work together at YP, and uh, <laughs> it was a great presentation. So hey. <laughs> hi to Cheryl. Um, and proof that this is all live, too. Um, okay, so last question, because I think we're about the end of our time. And if you have other questions, feel free to email Prashant, uh, reach out to him on Twitter, um, or use the hashtag SCJ Think Tank. And if you have questions, you can use that hashtag, and we email those to Prashant so he can answer those on Twitter after. So Thomas would like to know, um, how much content should be gated versus accessible to the public? Um, and then how much should be hidden and then leveraged in lead nurturing campaigns. So kind of, I think he wants to know, the, you know, what are the benefits to gated content if there are any? So I think uh, it really depends on, uh, so I think it's a much broader question where you probably, or the way I would look at it is, I want to run numbers through it. Uh, like why would you want to gate content? Uh, you know, is this a subs subscription-based model? Is there a different monetization aspect to uh, that gated content? If the numbers make sense, uh, so Wall Street Journal does does a lot of gated content. Uh, if the numbers make sense, then yeah, definitely go with it. Uh, but it it basically involves you know diving into your different revenue streams, looking at display advertising, uh, looking at your monetization models to figure out whether you want to gate content or whether you want to keep it open and drive drive traffic revenue transactions through that. So, uh, you know, it kind of goes back into calculating profitable content marketing. So benchmarking where you are currently, what your revenues look like, what your stream looks like, and then, you know, uh, slicing and dicing those numbers to figure out whether you want to gate some of it and, and charge folks for it. Yeah, I think it's something that's unique to each company um, or publication, figuring out which works, what works best for your audience. Okay, so yep. I think that's all we have for Q and A. Um, again, feel free to reach out or continue the combo on the hashtag SCJ Think Tank. And then also, when you close the webinar today, a survey is going to pop up and in your browser, and we would love if you would answer that because it really helps us um, figure out what we did. What we did what we so we would love if you could answer that. So, um, Prashant, with that, I think we're done. And to everyone, thanks for coming, and we'll see you next time. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Kelsey. Yep. Thank you. Bye.